Hi, I'm Devon. Welcome to West B. Are you ready to take some next steps here at West B? You are invited to join us for dinner on Sunday, May the 22nd at 5 p.m. in the chapel to learn about our vision, beliefs, expectations, and membership process. Additionally, we will explore ways you can serve through our ministries here at the church and child care will be available. Reserve your spot at connect.westb.org. We can't wait to meet you. Save the date for Saturday, May the 21st for our next We Love Bradenton. We are planning a special morning of serving for our entire family. Mark your calendars now. It's never too late to subscribe to our newsletter, and it's the best way to stay in the know with all that's going on. You'll receive a weekly devotion plan on Monday and another Thursday, which highlights church news and events. Subscribe now at newsletter.westb.org. Well, that's it for now. Let's worship together. I remember having a conversation with my wife, Erin, about how many children we should have as a family. And this was many, many years ago. And at the time, we had two biological children. We had two girls. And, you know, we, we were discussing, like, is, is two kind of where we want to be? And we both leaned, at the time of that conversation, we both leaned towards, you know what? I think two girls is what we desire, I think. Maybe that's what God wants us to have. Yeah, that's not what happened. That's not what happened at all. Um, we had another son. We foster kids. We've adopted. And at any given point, I can have, I don't know, 75 children in my house um, because that's what God wanted for us. Um, it's funny how things change. The Bible does not contain rules for how many children should be in each family? It's not like you can ask the question, okay, should I have four children or five children in my family? Should I adopt or foster? And you can, and you can go to the Bible and, and you're going to get a very clear answer. Yes, for you, this is the number that you need to have. It's not there. How do you make life decisions when the Bible's rules are not explicit to your exact situation? What do you do when the Bible does not contain step-by-step -step instructions about the fork in the road that is before you? We're going to be answering that question today. Uh, we're back in our series after a, a, a brief uh, Easter series. We're back to talking about God's story from beginning, in, beginning to end, walking through the entirety of the Bible. In the next couple weeks, we're going to be in First and Second Kings. We're going to be looking at Proverbs. We're going to be looking at the um, the character of Solomon, King Solomon, and specifically the topic of wisdom. Now, King Solomon is a case study of a conflicted and complex leader. I mean, this is the guy that built the temple but then split the nation of Israel. He uh, exercised godly wisdom, and we'll see an example of that here in just a little bit. So he, ex he exercised godly wisdom but then fell to his own sinful desires. He recorded incredible insight in Proverbs, but then also recorded deep wounds of laments in Ecclesiastes. Uh, he demonstrated a lot of passion for the passionate love for his wife in Song of Songs, but then he betrayed the covenant of marriage with having many wives. I mean, this very conflicted, very um, complex leader. Now, a little background to where we are uh, in the text. We're uh, and first and second kings. First and second kings were originally one book, but the reason they end up being first kings and second kings is because it's kings is long and there were two scrolls. So because of the length, they put half on one scroll and half on another scroll, and we just ended up with two books. Um, so you can call it kings, you can call it first and second kings, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's all one collective story. First Kings records the division of the United Kingdom. This is kind of when things begin to fall apart. And Second Kings 
is the complete collapse and ultimately captivity of Israel and Judah. Um, the books together cover about 400 years, so this is a long time period that is in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. 1 Kings accounts for about 100 years, and 2 Kings accounts for about 300 years. Now, it's important to note as you read that the author of 1 and 2 Kings looks at these kings not through the lens of worldly success, but rather where their hearts are and whether they were obedient to God or whether they were disobedient to God. So less attention is given to important political achievements that world history might record, the, the political achievements of, say, Omri, Jeroboam II, uh, or Uzziah, because they did have a lot of secular, secular success. But what the author does in each of these books is gives more attention to where they are spiritually, where are these kings spiritually? And there's a lot about religious apostasy um, of the kings, and that's uh, an abandonment of beliefs, and specifically the apostasy of Ahab, Ahaz, Manasseh, and then the more positive perspective about the religious reforms of Jehu, Hezekiah, and Josiah. So the author's primary concern is faithfulness and loyalty to God, not political prowess. So what happened? How did this kingdom that was established under Saul, that was highlighted under David, that was kind of, the, David's reign was kind of the peak, um, end up beginning to fall apart under the reign of Solomon? What, how did Solomon start with wisdom only to end up in folly? We're going to be talking about that today. But let's understand what got Solomon to this place. God had written the qualifications for future kings back in Deuteronomy. And so if you look at Deuteronomy 17, and specifically uh, beginning in verse 14, you're going to see God realizing that the people are going to want a king, and he, he already has parameters in place. So here's what Deuteronomy 17, 14 says. You are about to enter the land the Lord your God has given you. When you take it over and settle there, you may think we should select a king to rule over us like the other nations around us. If this happens, be sure to select as king the man the Lord your God chooses. You must appoint a fellow Israelite. He may not be a foreigner. The king must not build up a large stable of horses for himself or send his people to Egypt to buy horses. The Lord has told you, you must never return to Egypt. The king must not take many wives for himself because they will turn his heart from the Lord, and he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver and gold for himself. It goes on to talk about how he needs to read the Word of God every day. Here's the thing about Solomon. Solomon started with a lot of wisdom. Solomon did a lot of good, but Solomon disobeyed every single one of these things. He had a lot of gold. He had a lot of silver. He had a lot of horses. He had a lot of wives. All of those things he was not supposed to do. And he ended up reaping what he sowed. Galatians 6, 7, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Among the wisdom of God, Solomon planted weeds of folly. And the weeds of folly grew to overtake his wisdom. So let me give you a warning, and I think this is a very important warning for all of us myself included, you can lose the wisdom God gives. Look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Here's what it says. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Make out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. Now, next week, we're going to learn a lot more about wisdom. We're going to be talking about Proverbs specifically. And we're, we're going to, there's, Proverbs 4 is all about getting wisdom. We're going to talk about how to get wisdom. But for the sake of today, just know that you can lose it. If you can get it, you can lose it. This guard your heart language here is, is implying you've, you've got to work to keep it. When you gain wisdom, you have to guard it. And you guard your heart. What is the heart? The heart is the seat of emotions and will and all of who you are. So um, you see here verse 23, guard your heart. 
This is the core within you. This is your emotions, your will. This is what you give yourself to. That's your heart. Verse 24, you know, the, the mouth, protect the mouth. Um, this is the words that come out. Verse 25, guard the eyes. This is what you bring in. Verse 26, watch your feet. This is where you take yourself. Now, how are the heart and the feet connected? Well, who you are inside takes you to your desires on the outside. The heart is where the must-haves of your life reside. So, let me give you an example. If I have and then fill in the blank, then my life will be complete. So, certainly you've thought that. It would, you would be a strange person if you haven't had that thought. If I just have, fill in the blank, then my life will be complete. This is where your heart is. What, whatever the blank is, that's what your heart would choose. And what your heart chooses, your mind will assess as reasonable, and your emotions will gravitate towards that thing. You can talk yourself into anything when your mind and emotions are misguided. What your heart believes, you will think, I must have this. Now, this is what happened to King Solomon. He, his heart chased after so many things that ultimately were not of God. Let me read you something from Ecclesiastes. This is Solomon writing later in his life, and it's, um, it's a lament, but I think you'll get the picture when I read it. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 4. I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and by planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks, filling them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate, to irrigate my many flourishing groves. I bought slaves, both men and women, and others were born into my household. I also owned large herds and flocks, more than, more than any of the kings who had lived in Jerusalem before me. I collected great sums of silver and gold, the treasure of many kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers, both men and women, and had many beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire. So I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anymore. King Solomon writing here saying, I gave myself everything. I had all the money. I had all the leisure. I had all the sex. I had all the power. I had all the fame. And it amounted to nothing. Now, not all is lost with Solomon. Like I said, he's a case study in complexity. So let's look at a time when he was in a better place, where he showed his wisdom that he was capable of, of, of having. And this really, the, the story that we're about to see is Solomon at his best. This is the story that occurs right after God grants Solomon wisdom. So in 1 Kings chapter 3, God says, Solomon, what do you desire? And Solomon says, I want wisdom so that I can know how to lead people. And God grants him this wisdom. And then we see how Solomon uses this wisdom in a very tricky situation. So 1 Kings 3, verse 16. Sometime later, two prostitutes came to the king to have an argument settled. Please, my lord, one of them began, this woman and I live in the same house. I gave birth to a baby while she was with me in the house. Three days later, this woman also had a baby. We were alone. There were only two of us in the house. But her baby died during the night when she rolled over on it. Then she got up in the night and took my son from beside me while I was asleep. She laid her dead child in my arms and took mine to sleep beside her. And in the morning when I tried to nurse my son, he was dead. But when I looked more closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't my son at all. Then the other woman interrupted. It certainly was your son, and the living child is mine. No, the first woman said. The living child is mine, and the dead one is yours. And so they argued back and forth before the king. Then the king said, let's get the facts straight. Both of you claim the living child is yours, and each says that the dead one belongs to the other. All right, bring me the sword. So a sword was brought to the king. 
Then he said, cut the living child in two and give half to one woman and half to the other. Then the woman who was the real mother of the living child and who loved him very much cried out, oh, no, my Lord, give her the child. Please do not kill him. But the other woman said, all right, he will be neither yours nor mine. Divide him between us. Then the king said, do not kill the child, but give him to the woman who wants him to live, for she is his mother. When all Israel heard the king's decision, the people were in awe of the king, for they saw the wisdom God had given him for rendering justice. This is a crazy case study, but it's a story, a true story, in which the king demonstrates a lot of wisdom. And it's an excellent um, example of what wisdom looks like when you encounter those forks in the road where you have to make a decision. And here we see um, the, just this juxtaposition of almost two Solomons. It's the same person. But here we see his incredible wisdom and insight with this whole splitting the baby uh, example. But then, and so he's very wise here, but this is the same guy that would split the kingdom with his folly. And so complex leader, but here he gets it right. Now, what is wisdom? Wisdom is gaining godly competence when you face life's realities. You, you get off course when you make a choice that's not competent with life's realities. I mean, we've all been guilty of getting into a bad relationship or making a bad business decision or uh, making bad health choices, making a bad investment. We've all made the wrong choice when faced with a fork in the road. Solomon had to make a decision. This is a, this is a true fork in the road. There's no delaying this decision. There, there's, there's no um, putting this off. He, and, and, and part of the problem is he doesn't have any corroborating evidence. All he had was conflicting testimony from each woman. But what do you do? How do you make a decision? Wisdom is necessary when set rules do not apply. Let me give you an example. Um, correctly solving a math problem is not wisdom. I hope that you solve all of your math problems. But it, that's not true wisdom. I mean, x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all of that over 2a. Some of you just had some flashbacks to your schooling. There are rules to the quadratic equation, and you can solve the quadratic equation with these rules. Solving a math problem is not wisdom, but using math to design a more energy efficient building, now that's wisdom. Another example, um, learning theology is not wisdom. Many pastors make this mistake, so let me talk about my profession. I know very little about math. I had to look up the quadratic equation. Uh, I did not have it memorized. Now, theology, I know a little bit about that. Um, Learning theology is not wisdom, but combining your life experience with biblical truth to give sound advice, that's wisdom. Baseball. I love baseball. If you're part of West Bradenton, you know that. Learning the rules of baseball, not wisdom, but making the right decision to pull a pitcher or keep him in during the World Series, that's wisdom. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Math and baseball are one thing. But there are much deeper issues at stake. Let's, uh, let's think about some more real-life examples, but perhaps have some greater consequences than a baseball game. Let's think, maybe, maybe you've been offered a new position, and this new position comes with a huge pay increase, and it'll come with opportunities far beyond what you've ever dreamed of. But to take this position it will move your family into an unknown new location. What do you do? Do you take the job because it's going to give you and potentially your family more opportunities and more security? Or do you, do you take that risk, moving them away from some place where they're doing well to a place that has a lot of unknowns? 
takes a lot of wisdom to make that decision. Uh, perhaps a more painful example, let's you know, walk through where a spouse commits adultery and the one who has been, of, been offended has to ask that question, um, do I stay? Do I go? Do I leave? Uh, we've got children. What do I do? There are right and wrong choices with these examples. And often you won't know if you've chosen wisely until months, if not years later. We need God's wisdom. There are no rules, so to say, in the Bible that give these step-by-step -step instructions for making a decision about a new job or, or leaving your spouse in the case of adultery. I mean, in the case of adultery, the Bible speaks very clearly against it, but in terms of leaving your spouse, it's, it's permitted, the Bible says, but it's not required, so what do you do? And it's in these cases where we need God's wisdom from the Holy Spirit, competence regarding life's situations. Now, let's get back to the, the example of Solomon here, particularly in verse 28. This is the last verse. And it says there that the people looked at the king with awe. And because they looked at him with awe, they sought wisdom from him. Now, this is very important. Where you place your awe is where you will seek your wisdom. Do you want true wisdom? Well, if you want true wisdom, the way that you, that you find true wisdom is by having awe for the true king. Should you take that job that's offering more money and opportunities? Well, the answer to that question is, where is your awe? If your awe is in God, well, then you're probably going to make a better choice. But if your awe is in power or money or upward mobility, it's likely that foolishness will guide you. Misguided awe always leads to foolishness. So the question you need to ask yourself when facing very difficult decisions is, what is the ruling factor in my life? Is it God and his wisdom? Or am I chasing something else? Now, I want you to notice something here, particularly involving this text in 1 Kings 3. Solomon was never going to kill the child. Now, how do we know this? Well, he's not surprised by their reactions. It's not like oh, he's going, oh, 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 wait, oh, okay, I, th I thought I was going to have to cut the kid in half. Uh, oh, surprise, surprise, I didn't know this would happen. No, he, he has no intention of killing the child. The sword is not the solution. Wisdom is the solution. And how does Solomon exercise wisdom here? He finds a way to have these two women reveal their life's foundations. What is their awe? Notice that this wisdom, verse 28, last verse that we read, this wisdom came from God. This was wisdom God had given him. The false mother here represents foolishness. And she put her own motherhood above the life of the child. Her thinking is this child exists for me. But then we see the true mother who exemplifies wisdom here, where the child, the life of the child, is more important than her motherhood. And the thinking is, I exist for this child. When the sword is over the thing you love, what is your response? Do you rely on what God has given you? Or do you rely on your own strength and desires? The true mother here, though it's a heart-wrenching scene, her soul is at ease. And she demonstrates sacrifice, and she demonstrates con the true contentment, as difficult as it is, because it's the life of the child that is at stake. But the false mother here, she is bitter, spiteful, destructive, perhaps even evil. The true mother looked at the throne of the king and said, don't kill the child. Kill me. Don't ruin his life. Ruin mine. Don't tear him into, tear me into. She looked at the king and said, take everything from me and give him the hope. This story exists because it points to Jesus, 
another son would enter the story. And this son, God's son, would grow up and he would take the sword. Jesus would be cut in two so we could be made whole. Where is your awe? True wisdom is found only in the salvation of Jesus Christ.